this is the session five of the real transport mode. The objectives in this session are as follows. Number one, to understand what COTIB means and also each of its appendices. Two, to understand the essential differences in the uniform rules of CIM and SMGS that applies to the carriage of goods. Three, to understand the CIM contractual framework Four, to understand CIM contract of carriage. Five, to identify CIM liability of a carrier. And six, to understand the four CIM contractual framework, CIM contract of carriage, CIM liability of a carrier, handling and packing of goods. COTIV is an acronym coined for, from a French interpretation of the convention. And in short, COTIV is the convention concerning the international carriage by rail. It concerns international carriage by rail whether it's passenger or freight, they all come under Cotif Convention. This convention called Cotif is managed by an intergovernmental organization for international carriage by rail. That is what we refer to as OTIF. So OTIF is an organization that is made up of representatives of various governments from different states and they manage the convention called COTIF. There are about seven appendices that I would want to take you through on that COTIF. The first one is CIV. The CIV is about the International Rail Transport Law for Passengers. So when you go into the COTIF convention, and you want to find out something regarding the transport law for passengers, you will find it under CIV. The International Rail Transport Law for Freight Traffic, which freight forwarders are much concerned about, can be found under CIM. RID is the regulation that covers the carriage of dangerous goods and Free forwarders have a lot to do with that. The fourth appendix is the regulation on the contract of use of vehicles, real vehicles. The fifth appendix is the regulation on the contract of use of railway infrastructure. So you see there's difference. There's an appendix for the for contract on railway vehicles, and then a different regulation for the use of railway infrastructure. Number six appendix is the validation of technical standards and adoption of uniform technical prescription for railway materials. And the seventh appendix that we will deal with is ATMF, which is on the procedure for technical admission of railway vehicles and other railway materials used in international traffic. CIM uniform rules. The CIM contains the uniform rules concerning the contract of international carriage of goods by rail. That's the CIM. And that was a done in May 1980, but was amended um, in June 1999, and we call that the Vilnius Protocols. The Vilnius Protocol was to cater for development in the real sector. 
there has been some revisions of the CIM. The actual contract, you know, was agreed upon in 1980. That would be the contract of international carriage of goods by rail. She is goods, not passenger. So CIM is about pass, uh, it's about goods. It's not about passenger. And this was agreed upon and established in 1980. In 1995, the review was on the basis for the cross-border freight forwarding and liberalization and modernization of the CIM uniform rules. In 1999, the protocol of 1999, which happened in Vilnius, was the adaptation to the laws applicable to other transport modes, especially the CMR, which is for road transport, and modernization regarding liberalization of rail transport. So that was, you know, a bit on the revision, the historical development of the revision of CIM. Now, CIM contractual framework, which freight forwarders need to know, because to use any particular mode of transport, you need to understand the legal framework. And on the CIM, the contractual framework is outlined here for you. So I'll read through, and these bullet points are quite self-explanatory. Now it says, the first one, there is an important difference in the nature of rail transport contract compared to that of other modes. You see, this means the contract in rail transport is real than consensual as we have in road transport. In rail transport, the contract does not exist until the transport document made out by the shipper has been duly stamped by the railway and the transport document acts as a consignment note and it is not negotiable. So that's the first clause, that it is real. There is no contract unless the shipper makes out or completes the transport document and have it stamped and signed by the carrier, the railway. Without the document, which is not neg negotiable, there is no contract. That is what this means. And for wagons which are loaded by a shipper, example in a freight station, the transport operation is preceded by a request for a wagon. The contractual framework prescribes that the first action to be taken is for the shipper to order a wagon for use to carry their goods. It is not the carrier that gives you or decides which wagon you should use. The shipper must know. So if that is why a forwarder needs to know about the characteristics of the various wagons available in the rolling stock so that they can order for the appropriate wagon, which is the first step in the process. The next clause is the loading, including stowing, that is storing, and sheeting, sheeting is about documentation, is paid by the shipper. On the contractual framework of CIM, the loading, the storing of goods in the wagons, and the documentation is paid for by the shipper. So it is the responsibility of the shipper to pay for the cost of loading, so, you know, storing in wagons and then doing the documentation. In doing so, the shipper must pay attention to the constraints specific to this method of transport. And wedging, stowing, avoiding, overloading, paying attention to height and weight. See, this is why we have loading gauge established in every network or on every route. 
the shipper who loads the wagons must pay attention to the height and weight. It, the shipper must be guided by the loading gate when they are loading the wagons. And it says here that the shipper should avoid wedging and stowing and avoid overloading. Wedging is about uh, forcing cargo into available space. In rail transport, the loading has to be planned. So you put loads at the appropriate place. You don't just push load as we do in road transport. Once there is space, you push something into it. No, that is not allowed. That is what wedging is. Forcing cargo into spaces in the wagon. Not allowed. Stowing is just storing anything, just any just because there is space. And then overloading is not allowed. And the loading is guided by what? The loading gauge, which prescribes you know the height and weight for loading. The next is the wagon can be sealed, which is mandatory in combined transport and for certain types of goods. If the type of transportation that is the forwarder intends to use is combined transport, then the wagon has to be sealed because in combined transport, the cargo should not be touched at any stage until it's offloaded. So goods transported under combined transport should be sealed. The loading unit should be sealed. When wagons are used to transport cargo on that combined transport system, right, the goods must be sealed. 